Because I got an 80 year old too. I got two. This Friday is the I know. Hmm. All right. The biggest landslides in history. Goldwater would be painted as a dangerous radical, but I want to be very clear about Goldwater. Goldwater would be the beginning of a conservative revival that would really begin to take place, the backlash to the various movements of the 1960s, and come to dominate the Republican Party by the end of the decade. And there's also something else. This is the beginning of the Southern Strategy, where Republican strategists, best known would be a man named Kevin Phillips, but also Richard Nick. Southern wide resentment, and also northern wide resentment over the Civil Rights Movement as a way to wedge votes, but also as a way to get rid of the New Deal. Use that resentment as a way to get rid of the New Deal. And it was partially successful, in some ways remarkably successful. Do you have your uh, boss for this video recorded? Yeah. Okay. Stop the podcast. And so, Johnson would win, the great society, I mean the assumption was this is going to roll, he was uh, got a giant mandate, but the whole time, Vietnam. Vietnam, Vietnam. How do we deal with Vietnam? And it immediately blew up. The Viet Cong did a number of very high profile attacks on American and South Vietnam, South, South Vietnamese bases. The best known was in a place called Plaikou. Plaikou is right there in the Central Highland. Over 100 American soldiers would be killed or wounded, along with over 100 South Vietnamese soldiers. They had very accurate mortar attacks on this air base that Americans were flying missions in support of the South Vietnamese. And here's, think about Johnson, what he's thinking. I just got elected by this mandate, this huge mandate to do the Great Society, and the war blows up in my face. What do I do? I can't look soft on communism and get the Great Society, especially when... Going into January and February of 1965, he'd just been inaugurated this huge sweeping mandate. The issue of voting came up. The Voting Rights Act. Well, the voting rights. The Civil Rights Act of 64 did nothing about voting. Did nothing about the voting. The Grandfather's Clause and other methods still disenfranchised the vast majority of blacks in the South. And many, this is Georgia. Here is John Lewis, one of the Freedom Riders, being led to train. But this is Malcolm X. And Malcolm X would be at first more of a separatist, part of the black, the black Muslims. He became much more uh, as an ally to the mainstream civil rights movement, and Malcolm X sincerely believed it is time now to use even more force. I'm not talking violence, I just mean more in-your-face direct action to get the right to vote. But in a power struggle with the black Muslims in 1965, February, this, this is, what an amazing time, he was assassinated. And with Malcolm X's assassination, it just seemed to increase things to be done. And they began to push Johnson. Who said, can you wait? Can you wait on votes? No, we're not going to wait any longer. And so we had to do something. And here it is with American debt of Plaikou. Voting Rights Act. He wants other things passed. What does he do? Rolling thunder. Johnson thought the best way to go, it started out as relatively small, would turn into a four-year campaign of... North Vietnam will quit aiding the, the Viet Cong. It was called going to the peace table. They'll quit aiding the Viet Cong. Just limited, bomb a few targets. Yeah. And that, how much of this was being uh, told to the public? They were, now, this was, he was playing a balancing act. He told the public he was, they're doing the very limited bomb because he wanted to, he wanted to show he's anti-communist. But he also hid the scope of what was really going on. 
Because he didn't want people to realize how big and how time consuming this is going to be. On our uh, social front, there were people who were mad about the um, conscription or the draft. The draft. Not quite yet. Okay. Not quite yet, but it's going to blow up. Yeah. Why did they do that? Why did they decide? Why did uh, Johnson decide to do lower the number? Or to look tough on communism. He was scared that if he didn't, it would be thrown back in his face, especially by Robert Kennedy. John Kennedy's brother had just been elected to the Senate, and he was what they called then a hawk for a war. Remember the war hawks back in 1810? Those heady days of 1810? Well, hawk meant pro war. And Robert Kennedy was saying, you're losing South Vietnam. My brother's legacy is being destroyed. Lyndon Johnson's greatest fear was that he would be the mistake between the Kennedys. John Kennedy did Robert Kennedy. We'll get to it. And so, Rolling Thunder began at the same time civil rights leaders organized in March from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama. Alabama and their governor, George Wallace, who we'll get to later, became the symbol of the anti-civil rights movement, the segregationist <laughs> South. They were one of many states at that time started changing their flag to do the Confederate battle flag. They were putting the Confederate battle flag all over the place. Yeah, the Confederate battle flag also made a reemergence as anti-civil rights. You go to Mississippi, it's still on the state flag, the Confederate battle flag, to show we're not going to allow Jim Crow to end. Still there. And they were attacked by the police. They set fire hoses on them, guard dogs on them, all on television. A very peaceful, organized march. Just basically trying to get people to notice um, there's voting right there, some violence in Selma. So they marched this 10 miles to Montgomery, the capital. And this forced Johnson to act. Johnson now is going to be forced to act. But he did two things at once. He came out in front to a joint session of Congress and made an impassioned speech. Arguably his greatest speech. He wasn't that good at giving a, a formal speech, but he gave one of his greatest speeches where he demanded that it's time that every American does their constitutional right and their rights from the Declaration of Independence and be allowed to vote. And he quoted uh, the spiritual We Shall Overcome, which became kind of the song of the Civil Rights Movement. It's a really remarkable speech. I remember this from a white Southern Democrat. Southern Democrats at this time were all segregationists, most. There were no blacks, Democrats, or Republicans in the South. They couldn't vote yet. And Johnson made these speeches, an impassioned speech. He went to the Senate, and it's, you know now this is the big fight. By the way, he walked off, and he said to his aide, Bill Moyers, he said, I think I might have just destroyed the Democratic Party for the next 50 years. <laughs> Because this will blow up the Democratic Party. And he knew that the opposition party would use this as a wedge to break up the Democratic Party. And they did. Shockingly effectively. I mean, so well that it's almost mind-boggling. Today, 90% of this, 90% of Southern whites vote Republican. So it's remarkable how effective it was and how clairvoyant, clairvoyant Johnson was in 1965. But if he's going to get a pass, he can't look soft on communism. He can't allow another play coup. So he needs troops to defend American air bases. Can't trust the South Vietnamese. So, at the same time, I mean, this is just a remarkable series of events. U.S. Marines landed at the har harbor city of Da Nang. Right here, Da Nang's right there. They hit the beaches, really dramatic shots of them hitting the beach. They were met by pretty Vietnamese girls with flowers. It was kind of a surreal thing. But here's the issue. Okay, now they're defending a base, about 6,000 Marines, a brigade. And the Marines are sitting there furious because Viet Cong would come in, lob a couple mortar rounds, and then run away. What do they want to do, the Marines? Right. Go after them. That means going to combat. They can't do that. Well, that means a major escalation. A major escalation. Do we do this? So it was the logic of escalation in the war. We can't allow South Vietnam to be unified with Vietnam. Communism, domino theory. So we sent advisors. Didn't quite work, so we start actually flying missions and supporting them. Then we start bombing the north. 
and the South, they started bombing too. Finding guerrilla sanctuaries. Then we have to send troops to defend the air bases. Now we have to go out and get the guerrillas to full combat. And this is where coming to the key moment. Johnson has all these bills, the most important, the Voting Rights Act, he wants passed. What about Vietnam? Every advisor he called in, all his key advisors, all of them, there they are, sitting in the Oval Office, all the members of the National Security Council came in. And every single one except for this guy, George Ball, said, we can go. We can go. Go in there, you send troops. The North will quit aiding the Viet Cong. We can win. <clears throat> now, it's actually easier to escalate than pull out, to Johnson's mind. Because if he pulled out, he would look weak. He couldn't do it, even though he just won a landslide. This would have been the perfect time for Lyndon Johnson. This is what George Ball, the advisor, who is Assistant Secretary of State, said. Declare victory and, and pull out. Say, we won. He couldn't do it. I don't want to look like I lost. The Great Society will die. And so, oh, and one more thing. Robert McNamara was his Secretary of Defense. McNamara, one of the most intelligent men in, at least considered to be intelligent, he was a brilliant guy. He died just a couple years ago. Yeah, just a, with a memory for facts and figures. He was Kennedy's Secretary of Defense. Johnson called him his lard hair man because he used a lot of real clean. And lard. Oh, no. And McNamara said, I've done it mathematically. He made this up. If we bomb just enough targets and send just enough troops, the North will finally agree. Ho Chi Minh will agree and go to the peace table to negotiate permanently to Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh will agree. In fact, Johnson said, we'll bomb them and we'll also give them money. Kind of the carrot and stick. They never realized that Ho Chi Minh and the vast majority of Vietnamese wanted one Vietnam. And they were tired of fighting foreign invaders and they wanted never understood that they just couldn't be bought off. And so Johnson accepted this because it seemed easier. I can still look tough. And so they began to gradually send in troops. He did it rather casually. June 1965, while the Voting Rights Act was being debated in the United States Senate, Johnson casually announced at a press conference, I'm sending in troops. Hey, um, it's called the Air Cab, but it's hel helicopter mobile, mobile troops, Marines, a few other support troops. And he could do it because of the Tonkin Golf Resolution. Very casually announced it, troops went in. 65. If I said 67, I'm sorry. These are the main reasons. He's thinking the only way I could really get the Great Society to work is to get this passed. He could get bills passed. But he knew that the bills were going to have to be tinkered with. You know, this was all new. And some of the programs just simply weren't very good. And so they would have to be changed. But he just he wanted to bill pass, we'll change them later. That was his thinking. Which by the way, yeah, I think you might see some problems with that thinking. Next, JFK's legacy. He doesn't want people to say he let Kennedy down by letting South Vietnam go. The last speech Kennedy was going to give before his assassination, Kennedy bragged about the successful new government in South Vietnam. Next, they kept talking about Berlin. Even though tensions were lower, he had to maintain this credibility. Nobody believed we'll defend Western Europe or West Berlin if we don't fight in Vietnam. But then here's the amazing thing. Johnson was told it would take two or three years to get enough troops into Vietnam to actually fight it. It's going to cost billions of dollars and thousands of lives. It won't be until probably 68. It's going to be incredibly costly. He knew it would be costly in both money and lives, and disruption of lives, and he kept that cost secret. Thinking. If I tell people what really was going to happen, the Great Society will be picked away at. I think you might see the problem now with the whole strategy. What would the 
expenditure of $140 billion total in the war, how could he keep his great society running? Exactly. What happened is you exactly said it. Because he didn't increase taxes. To, uh, well, they did until the end. 68, they finally did raise taxes. But yeah. They actually cut taxes first to keep it. Yeah. To save the Great Society, he went to war. To save the Great Society, they kept the cost secret. What's going to happen to the Great Society? Die. They'll get bills passed, but all the money's going to go to Vietnam. All the money will go to Vietnam. So Justin's exactly right there. And then one more big thing. Regardless of if the programs are good or not, once Vietnam became the most dominant issue, they couldn't go back and change it. Does that make sense? Now we stuck with it because all everyone's talking about by 68 is Vietnam, <laughs> Vietnam, Vietnam. Yeah. Why was he worried about JFK's legacy when he got elected? You know, and that's what his advisors told him. Why do you care? He couldn't. He couldn't let it go. He was so terrified of Robert Kennedy. They hated each other. But they were from the same party. That happens all the time. Yeah. They're rivals. You know. Did, uh, did the lack of money cause any type of recession or infrastructure crumbling? What's going to happen is, it's not so much if, even though there will be in the inner city because all the tax base left, and he promised federal money to help, but there's no federal money. What it's going to lead to is inflation. Because so much of the money that would be spent in the U.S. is now being sucked up by the war. It's not so much the, it's not the social program, it's the war. That's going to suck up the money. You get the outrageous living costs in New York City. Yeah, especially by the 70s. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, it's doomed. And so Johnson, you know, passed a number of laws. Some were successful, some weren't. But it will never be what he wanted. And for the rest of his presidency, it's more just trying to salvage it. Once he made the decision, Vietnam, war dominates everything. And there's something else about the war. And I didn't put this down, but the draft. They had to stop the draft. Johnson made a conscious decision not to call it the Reserves or National Guard because that would be so disruptive to families. But what that meant is you have to get volunteers, and a lot of people volunteered, especially at first, but now those numbers drop dramatically. Then you have to draft young men. And so they started the first larger and larger calls of 19 year olds, then eventually 18 year olds, and we called to the draft. Now there's some Nothing about that. Unfairly. It's being chosen by local draft board. Friend. And at first, you could get out of the draft if you went to college. What happened to enrollment in college? So who's left? Yeah, poor man. If you got married, you could get out. Marriages went up dramatically. It's no coincidence that. When women finally won more equal rights and, and out, able to get out of really bad marriages, you could always very hastily done marriages. There'd be a lot of divorces in the 70s. And then if you had to have kids. Yeah. My uncle was 18 and my dad was 16. And my, my uncle got drafted, but he was going to get like married or whatever. And he was going to so they defer it. Yeah. But my dad got like, even though he was 16, he got like a draft card and they were like, Oh, when the war is still going on, you'll be in. They just gave him a card, but we're like, we can't draft you now because you're not 18. Yeah, they got a draft card. But my, but the war is over by the time my dad turned 18. Yeah, and in fact, in my class, uh, Mr. Chauncey kept his draft card. We're talking about that. Yeah, you got a draft card, and and in 1979, the uh, Cold War kind of silliness when the kind of the cold um, began to heat up again, um, they started to once again register for the draft to reestablish that. So all you young men have to register. Like yeah, it's it's. I, I don't know it's why tough. that was the proof we're tough on communism, and and now it's just it's still there. It's like an inertia. They still make you do that. Not that it's a big deal, but it's weird. Yeah. How would they do that now? Like, it's weird. So they just send you a letter. Hey, come here. You have to go and register. You're 18. And you can see what happened. The number of troops began to go up. It took a while, but by '68, look how many troops, American troops, were there. Only about one out of ten were actually in combat. But what happened was there were a few high profile battles in 65, but there weren't enough troops. And so they had to build them up. And every time they build up more troops and more men get in combat, the casualty numbers got greater and greater and greater. 
and more and more impact on people back at home. But it seemed to work in the short run. This is important to understand Lyndon Johnson's thinking. The three biggest bills after the Civil Rights Act of the Great Society would all pass that summer. The three most controversial. Of course, the Voting Rights Act passed. Got it. And that's him signing it, giving the pin to Martin Luther King. But so did Medicare and Medicaid. Medicare is health care for whom? The elderly. the elderly. And it comes from a payroll tax. We all pay a payroll tax, and the federal government is the health insurer for the elderly. Health insurance for the elderly is incredibly expensive. And so this was a way, it's called social insurance. You spread the cost out to everybody, it makes it affordable. And it is an incredibly popular program. Um, but because our health care has something to do with Medicare, but our health care is so expensive in the US, over twice as much as most other industrialized countries. It's twice as much and we live shorter. It, we pay a lot for yeah, it's, it's a flawed system. But that's him signing it. Harry Truman, that's him. Harry Truman's still alive. Harry Truman was there. And Medicare, Medicaid's health care for the poor. Health care for the poor, yeah. Um, so were the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act the same? No, different laws. Voting, Civil Rights Act was 64, Voting Rights Act 65. And the Voting Rights Act ended, ended the practice of, Jim Crow laws. not Jim Crow laws, but like the Grandfather's Clause and allowed the Justice Department. This is the big thing about the Voting Rights Act. The Justice Department could go in, the US Federal Justice Department, and stop actions that keep people from voting. And they've been doing it all the way till just six months ago. You'd be surprised how many times there's violations of Voting Rights Act to keep the poor and blacks from voting. Voter ID laws were big. But the Supreme Court ruled that unconstitutional, and so now all these voter ID pass, laws passed to try to keep the poor from voting. It's amazing how it kind of makes the cycle and goes back to the way it was before. Why would today it's kind of hard to imagine people who Ninety percent of blacks vote Democrat, and Republican majorities in places like Pennsylvania and southern states try to do things to keep blacks from voting. They brag about it. The head of the Republican Party of Pennsylvania said this new voter ID law is going to um, have, have, have Mitt Romney take Pennsylvania. But the Justice Department, because the Voting Rights Act, turned it down. Now it's back. Yeah. It's, it's not, it is, it's unpleasant. But I shouldn't lie to you about what's going on. This is a big deal. It seemed to work. Johnson got it passed. But. As he did that, the war got more and more brutal. And we're going to skip that to General Westmoreland. General Westmoreland was the commanding general of all American forces. <coughs> and, well, also American forces and South Vietnamese forces. And Westmoreland has a problem. I have a limited number of troops. South Vietnam is huge. Vietnamese guerrillas are coming in. Or, I'm sorry, um, South Viet, or Viet Cong guerrillas are getting supplies along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and as Americans sent more troops, North Vietnam began to send their troops, matching the escalation to help the Viet Cong. Not near as many, but a guerrilla army, you don't need as many troops. In a guerrilla war, the Standard definition of the way to fight a guerrilla war was you need 10 troops for every one guerrilla. Because guerrilla can attack anywhere. We wouldn't have near that many. Not near enough. And so he had to come up with a strategy to go out, and this is the important thing. How do you defeat a guerrilla <coughs> army? Kill them. You've got to find them and kill them. Thus his strategy was called search and destroy where they sent out units into the jungle. And in fact, this is, this is a tunnel raft going into one of the unbelievably complex tunnels that the Viet Cong would dig to protect themselves from American air raids. The Americans begin dropping so many bombs on South Vietnam, on guerrilla sanctuaries. In fact, by 68, they dropped more bombs on South Vietnam than they did in all World War II. Well. 
they got to find them. And what happened is the standard guerrilla tactics. The guerrillas don't really fight big units. They retreat in the jungle. So you got to go into the jungle and hope what happens to you. They get shot at. Yeah, you get ambushed. By the way, any volunteers for that? Let's go walk into the jungle and you're not hiding. You, you, you want to be seen. You want to be ambushed. So you got to go into the jungle and hope you're shot at by somebody behind a tree. Ambush. You run into an ambush because let's say you're walking through the jungle and somebody shoots at you over there. That's where the enemy is. Then a superior American firepower will blow that area away. Artillery and planes. Yeah. So do the commanders tell their troops, like, hey, go try and get shot at? Yeah, well, yeah, they know. Okay. It's horrible well, from around. Why wouldn't they wear, like, giant orange or something? <laughs> well, <laughs> if, if they try to do that, if they try to do that, uh, I, I, there'd be a mutiny. But trust me, American soldiers march. There, there were mutinies by 69. American soldiers going through the jungle stood out. Everybody knew they were coming. And this, you can imagine how hard it would be on the very small percentage of soldiers. And even though they tried to limit the exposure, uh, they would only be in, in Vietnam, in country, they called it, for 12 months. Marines would be 13 months because we were Marines. They, uh, um, combat soldiers were in the jungle the whole time. And their casualty rates were outrageously high from booby traps and small arms. And since most of the soldiers were not in combat, they might have gone through a pretty rough time in Vietnam, but the combat soldiers went through hell going through the jungle, trying to get ambushed. And yes, they killed a lot. But think about it for a second. Let's say there's a little village, a little area over there, and someone shoots at you. Is the whole village being calm? You're exactly right. Would you take that chance? Didn't they strap bombs to kids? Not really. But that became the um, that became the legend to be to be terrified of them. No, suicide bombing was not a strategy of the economy. Because my oh yeah, it would be in in Iraq and Afghanistan, but that's a different type of world war. My dad has a friend who went to Vietnam too and came back and like. Everyone was calling him a baby killer and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's that's the story that people have. I don't know if that's true. It's never been recorded. There's no film of that. There's no recordings. There's no contemporary documentation of any of that happening. So we don't know. That sounds a lot like a myth. Because trust me, Hawks would have filmed it if that was going on. That, that would have been on the nightly news, especially when Nixon was president. And there's just no film in that. And so I think it's become like when people say it enough, it becomes. Well, it's like what they were calling the soldiers who came back. Because I know, no, that's why I said there's no evidence of that happening. Except for people after the fact, years afterwards. I'm not saying that he's lying, probably not, but it's not cut and dry. I hear that all the time. No, no evidence. Yeah. So in this war, even though some a lot of the media that was being or the, I should say, the coverage that was being censored by the government, right? A little bit, but this was the most open war, and it was basically pro-war. So I was going to say, is a lot of the um, stuff coming back to the United States pro-war? Yeah. The, the actual narration was relatively pro-war, the Reds are on the run sort of thing. But any footage from, from war, by definition, if you show the real thing that was relatively uncensored, That's you. war is anti-war, by definition. No. Scenes of the war made people realize, what the heck are we doing there? That's why they tried so hard today to censor what happened in, let's say, Iraq and Afghanistan. They did everything they could to censor and control the media. Because real scenes of war are horrific. And it's not glamorous at all. It's not romantic. It's hell. And you think about it for a second. So there's a fight from a village. Someone fired it. That must be the Viet Cong. I'm not going to take a chance. Let's blow it away. Artillery, bombs, and napalm. Out of that would have become one of the most famous pictures of the war. A napalm attack on a South Vietnamese village. Attacked by, this was actually South Vietnamese planes, but you know it's all on the same side. I think you've probably seen this picture before. She's running from a burning village. Her clothes were burnt off. She has horrific burns on her body. Napalm just scorched it. And she's running down the street in agony. This was a South Vietnamese attack. 
Actually, when they first came out, they came out as a Viet Cong attack with white phosphorus. But actually, it was a South Vietnamese, our ally, a napalm attack. And the problem is this. I'm not condemning. It, it's too easy to condemn you know, the soldier for making a rash decision. Heck, if I was in there and someone shooting at me, I'd want the shooting to end. I want to live. But you put people in that situation, what are they going to do? Especially when you don't know who the enemy is. The problem is, these kind of attacks are going to lead to more resistance, more resistance to more guerrillas. And by the way, the Viet Cong did some of the same stuff. They were almost, they were as brutal, not almost, they were as brutal, brutal, they just didn't have the Air Force. These kind of wars are the worst type of wars. But here's the thing, how do you know you're winning? Oh, oh let's get to that one in a sec. I'll come back, don't forget to come back. What they would do is they would do body counts. <coughs> I'll explain why I have a, a shot from the original, um, the original Lewis Carroll Wizard of Oz, or I mean, um, Alice in Wonderland in a second. Who's read Alice in Wonderland? Only a few? It's awesome. You, you can also see the, the, the influence of opium, but it's still awesome. <laughs> okay, let me count the number of people that killed. Now, how are you going to get promoted? You kill them. Yeah. You kill them. Is it there, you know, what, let's say you destroy this area where there's gunfire. I mean, you napalm artillery rounds, you go through and you can't find anything. You kill a dozen people. Exactly. <laughs> or, that was like a spot of blood. That was probably six people. <laughs> and you can probably guess what happened. On the field, that might have started out as, like, exaggerated on the field. Let's go 12. Then it would get back to division headquarters, and that would become 24. Then it'll go to Saigon and it'll be announced as we killed 250. By 67, there are reports that the United States killed significantly more members of the Viet Cong than there were Viet Cong. <laughs> and then they come up with a kill ratio. What's kill ratio? We killed this many, we lost this many, it's 10 to 1, we won! Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> so, with that, and by the way, I mean, whatever about the video games, I've never actually seen them. Um, to me, so I, I, I'm still I can palm. But, but, um, I, the games are probably better than uh, than real life. And it's funny that I heard people say, "Oh, you can." I'm not kidding. This is from teachers say. You can have your students play and they'll learn so much. What? <laughs> You're hurting teachers by saying dumb stuff like that. But back to this, okay. <laughs> the problem is nobody knew they were telling the truth. And there would be the press conference at noon every day and the media would come out and Saigon and they would tell them, we've killed thousands. And they called it the, the, the um, noon follies. And they knew they were lying. And pretty soon nobody knew the truth. Nobody knew what was really going on in combat. Nobody knew what was telling the truth. Nobody knew what kind of government South Vietnam. No one had. And the, the media started saying it's like Alice in Wonderland in Saigon. We have no idea. Nobody knows the truth. And that is a reporter because what they gave are little snippets. And they were sanitized, but you still saw many people. It's the beginnings of the nightly news. And more and more people started getting their news from the three networks. It's not like that today so much anymore. And they would sit, in fact, TV, more and more people had television, so it became a big deal to eat while you watch TV. And so you'd be watching TV with the 6 o'clock news on. And here you have scenes of the war while you eat. And even though the press coverage was relatively pro-war, the scenes were anti-war. And so it began to build up. This feeling of more and more Americans that I want to win, but we got to end this thing. It's you see the contradiction there. I'll come back to lightning at the end of the tunnel in a second. But one of the things I started doing this one they kept secret. They're hiding in the jungle, aren't they? Let's get rid of the jungle. They call it Operation Ranch Hand. But they would dump millions of gallons of a very dangerous herbicide. Actually, four, but the most toxic with something called Asian Orange. And they dumped this over the jungle, covering the entire jungle. It didn't work. And it didn't work at all. And it would get into the skin and be absorbed into the skin of anybody there. So, for example, thousands of veterans started coming back and developing tumors. 
and their children had birth defects by the 1980s. And the South Vietnamese, who now by then Vietnamese, started getting horrific accounts of birth defects and, and cancer. The United States government finally acknowledged this in, in uh, 1986, that they were responsible for this. And it didn't work. They killed a lot of the jungle, but then what they leave? Transformed. Just, yeah, just kind of this ruin, and yeah, the stuff would come back. It still was places high. It didn't work at all. But, okay, we'll come back to Johnson. I should tell you one story. So there's Johnson. That's his beagle. He had two beagles. Do you want to know the beagle's names? Yes. That's Little Beagle Johnson 1. The other dog was Little Beagle Johnson 2. LBJ, LBJ. I'll tell you more stories about talk later on. But Johnson, in 1967, had gallbladder surgery. He had a heart attack in 58 when he was Senate Majority Leader and almost died. And so he wanted to prove that it was just gallbladder surgery. And Johnson was like this. You want to see my star? <laughs> now, in 1967, if you had gallbladder surgery, that was a star. They have better instruments now. Even though it's still the same basic technique, so the star would only be this big. Don't get me wrong, I wouldn't want a star this big either. But look at this star. And so he's showing this off. You know, Johnson was like this. And one of the most famous political cartoons of this era would come out of it. By 67, the war in Vietnam was becoming a scar for Johnson. Isn't this awesome? You see the scar? Isn't that a clever cartoon? And by the way, Johnson had a huge nose, big ear. Cartoonists love that. You look at any cartoon of Obama, he has got big ears, so big ears. Uh, um, which had a big head. Yeah, and so I yeah, have that same thing. You know, President Clinton had the biggest head I've ever seen. I'll tell you that story after the test. And so it's always a big head. You know, things like that. You know, cartoonists always try to exaggerate those little things. Sometimes it works. I want to work here. I'm going to pass this, but this would be the beginnings also of any war protest. This is a protest in 1965. And you'll notice something about the anti war protesters, which would be the norm for the entire war. They were clean cut from a cross section of American society. It would be, when the war became very divisive by 1970, it would be that the, the anti-war movement were a bunch of drug addicts and a new movement called hippies. That really wasn't true. It wasn't. It was from a broad cross-section and a broad section of ages. Of course, you can imagine it's going to be mostly college age because those are the people that are most affected directly by the draft. And the Students for a Democratic Society would be one of the first leaders, kind of a new left uh, movement, and they did what's called teach-ins. And they had these teach-ins, and they would come together, and they would try to, in college campuses, the big, the first really big one was at the University of Berkeley. By the way, that's back when California had three schools. That'd be awesome. That's why they got rid of them, to stop the anti-war protests. Wow. That, and to, put, and to put college students in debt. Stupid. Yeah, really. But California is like, well, then it was pretty conservative. But. Oh, so then why haven't yeah, they changed it back? Conservative, they don't want to get free money. They're not, though. Not anymore. No, yeah, but now they, they, there's a shortage of money, so college is super expensive. Yeah, they, California has laws where it's almost impossible to raise taxes. Almost impossible. Really? Why? Proposition 13, we don't have time to go to California. They don't think it'll be exactly. But, 65 thousands came out to Washington D.C. In '67, over 100,000 people bleh, surrounded the Pentagon, and McNamara had them all come here. No bullets in the MPs' rifle. He in fact they could out not bullets. He didn't want anybody shooting. And I was like this picture putting flowers in the library barrels. But <laughs> very clean cut. There was a little bit of you know because it was pushing and shoving, but trying to fight and push against the war. And there was a growing undercurrent, growing movement against the war, hitting the streets. But still, by the end of 67, the vast majority of people, 60% by most polls, still supported staying in this thing, even though there had been 15,000 American soldiers killed by the end of 67. Oh, it's only going to get worse. But... Right after, what a time, 
<laughs> and I didn't mention the Beatles. Right after the Voting Rights Act was signed, and for the next four summers, they became known as the Long Hot Summers. All over, but the best known were in Watts, which is an area of LA, Detroit, Newark, New Jersey. There were huge, and they started out as protests, usually against police violence against blacks. Blacks were always routinely stopped and arrested. Routinely? Yeah. Go to New York City today. Well, you'd probably be fine. But if you're a young black man, you are arrested immediately. For? Just stop. Just stop and search. Always. Yeah. Do they do that, though? Like, is that, I don't even think That's their really policy. But isn't that racial profiling? They, no, I'm not kidding. They say that it's policy is called stop and frisk. Any black or Hispanic in New York and most in a lot of cities are stopped to be. Huh? Oh yeah, it was a big deal in the mayoral election, and the new mayor is trying to change that. But a lot of people are fighting against it. But the point is, police, you know, blacks were always being stopped. It started usually with police violence, but then it erupted in just rage, riots, and there's no logic to riots. They burned down their own communities. They attacked each other. And National Guard troops had to be called out. Looting happened. I mean, the riots have no logic. Yeah? Well, my dad grew up in Detroit and there's tons of stories about this. It'd be pretty in scary. Family, yeah. They sent uh, the, uh, the 17th Airborne Division into Detroit. Yeah, they that's in Los Angeles, but the same thing. I mean, this is, wow. And then in Newark, police sharpshooters, in 1967, their orders were to shoot any young black man on the streets in the riot. I mean, just start shooting them, bang, 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 from sniper's nests on top of tall buildings. Life had a 12-year-old boy shot. Just start shooting them. Hundreds died. Here's the thing. The civil rights movement when it was focused on the laws, had a lot of support. But laws were passed, expectations went up, but the economic situation, especially in the inner cities of the north, the economic situation didn't change. They're still poor, the unemployment rate is high, and by 67, they're the ones being drafted to go fight. While people with money got out. Now there's no logic to it. But this would begin the um, start of white backlash against the civil rights movement. And at first it was, why can't they just be happy with what, what we gave them? Which, of course, is garbage. No, they fought and got those laws passed. But then there's something else that happened. More and more of the cry went, look what happened when you gave people like that rights. Look what they did. And the call by 68 became, and this is what we do have to get down, Law and order. And law and order was code. And everybody knew it was code for cracking down on blacks. And this would be the beginnings of the black power movement. And this would bleed over into the army. And the black power movement focused on this idea of black consciousness. We can't sit back and hope that whites will allow us to become like other whites. We are going to push this idea that they're special about being black. Black consciousness. Uh, black is beautiful became the slogan. That's where you start seeing more and more, uh, well, in fact, the term Negro went away and black became used. And black is beautiful. People start dressing up like blacks. And Afros became in style because that's the way their hair grows. People with curly hair, their hair grows like that. And Stokely Carmichael, would become one of the leaders of the most, the most uh, um, articulate spokesperson for this new movement, and he had a target on his head for the rest of his life. He would be arrested numerous times. In fact, the first gun control law passed in the modern era would be passed in 1968, signed by Governor Ronald Reagan in California, to keep the guns out of the hands of the black consciousness movement. And so, what a time we had here. You missed that. Yeah. What year did Dr. King get? We're coming right up to it. 68. 68 was a tough year. 
all through 67, Lyndon Johnson was saying that there's light at the end of the tunnel. We're winning the Vietnam War. The war is almost over. And then what happened? It didn't. <laughs> on January 31st, don't write down everything here because I'm not going to tell you all the details of this. On January 31st, 1968, on the Vietnamese New Year, the Viet Cong did the Tet Offensive. Tet is the Vietnamese New Year. It was a surprise attack. Don't worry about the whole Ho Chi Minh Trail in case on. Oh, I don't have time to tell you about all the details of it. But the Viet Cong plan was they would attack all the major cities and trigger uprisings. They would trigger the South Vietnamese to uprise, overthrow the government, won Vietnam. It took the Americans and the South Vietnamese completely by surprise, but they recovered very quickly. Yeah. Well, uh, were the South Vietnamese in support of American troops? So yes. Like but they were hoping that South Vietnamese civilians, they thought, really didn't support this, the corrupt South Vietnamese government, and given the opportunity, they'd overthrow it. Um, you remember the Americans were just as delusional for like the pay of It turned out it didn't happen at all. This would become one of the biggest victories for the United States and South Vietnamese forces during the war. But no one believed it. You want to know why no one believed it? Let me show you two scenes. First off, oh, that's case I'm not. This is a Viet, a Viet Cong sapper, which is a combat engineer that knew how to use explosives. They got into the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. And they had to be rooted out. Almost all were killed. That doesn't look like victory. Johnson was saying nearly one. Staff, students, pardon the interruption. Students like uh, who had winning floats in the vigilante parade, just a reminder today at lunchtime in the gym, uh, we will be uh, awarding the prizes once again for those of you that received a place in the vigilante parade. Thank you. And let me show you one more picture. Now, this one is gruesome. In the street fighting in Saigon, one of the most famous pictures of the war, I know you can put your stuff away, but it's police chief of South Vietnam, summarily executed, it's suspected to be a con. I mean, literally, this is on NBC film. He's got walked up and went, bang! Oops. <laughs> this is on film. You can watch it. It's horrific. His head just explodes. They always stop it right there. But here's the point. This is on the street fighting in Vietnam. And he, I mean, literally, he's just talking, then turns and shoots. That doesn't look like the that looks like a defeat. Okay, we'll finish this on Thursday. Oh, so tomorrow at noon, I will be here, and then the first big review session tomorrow at what time? Six. We're at? Yeah. When do you want us to get our DBQs to you? Oh, DBQs, you can give it to me then. You can give it to me tomorrow at lunch, or if you just come by right, uh, right, when school, right when school starts tomorrow. Okay. Sound good? Yeah. I've got mine right now. Yeah, give it to me. How much what order would you want to do? The outline on top, and then the essay, and then the document. Brian, how much of the social I was on civil rights and then Vietnam War? A little bit civil rights. The only thing you need is the anti-war movement. Something about the anti-war movement. And how disruptive this was, especially when it became the hawks versus the doves. Can I borrow a pencil for a moment? Public space. How was it? I thought the documents were pretty good. Yeah, they were. Yeah, I thought they fit in. Did I tell you, this is the actual DBQ they, they uh, gave. Dude, this is one. They, they gave them an easy one because they here's your three paragraphs. Well, not only that, what's really funny is I gave a practice one. And it was over. Almost verbatim. It had, in fact, it had five of the same documents. I just nice. gave that one out. Actually, I think this one's a little better for you guys to do. But isn't that funny? And the kids were like, yeah! <laughs> what should do it? it? We did really well on that. Uh, what stinks is that you can't connect the documents and not to everything. Like you can connect it to like eighty percent of it, but like there was a lot that I felt like I had to leave out. Well, you know the thing about it, yeah, you, you don't have time. And so figure out what you want. The most important, the best way to look at it is think what you feel the most confident about. Just stick with that. Did, did you just uh, Yeah.